up, everybody? Welcome to the Total Human Optimization Podcast. You know, for this being an Onnit show, we don't really talk about Onnit products that much, if you can believe that. But today, we're going to switch that up a little bit. We're going to talk about Shroom Tech Sport, one of my favorite products. I've been with the company for like five years, and when we first started, we had three products, and that was Alpha Brain, New Mood, and Shroom Tech Sport. And for some reason, Shroom Tech Sport just automatically became my favorite. And as we've had tons of different athletes come in here, WWE people, NFL people, UFC people, they all love Shroom Tech Sport. So here today we have Sean Heisen and Vince Kripke, and we're going to talk a little bit about this product because it's awesome. And if you're an athlete, this is something that's going to revolutionize everything you do. It's going to help you perform better. It's going to help you with your stamina, your oxygen utilization. It's really, really awesome. So Vince, I'm going to start with you because you know all the science about the ingredients and, and all that stuff. So what is it about Shroom Tech Sport that makes it so amazing? So um, just to start, it's, it's, there's a lot of base in that traditional Chinese medicine that um, a lot of companies are also looking into, but on it seems to have really gotten to the forefront before everybody else, which is really sweet. Um, the two main... Uh, ingredients that I would, I would really look at are the Roliola Rosea and the Cordyceps. Together, they've been shown to have some great impacts on um, endurance styles of training and uh, actually by themselves. So when you put them together, there's more of a synergistic effect sometimes, uh, which is what on hopes for, to be honest. And um, so those together and then the uh, it's a really complicated kind of metabolic process that can, sounds complicated. Yeah, that um, we could fill up these entire walls with uh, <clears throat> notes, but we're not going to do that. Um, well, what are those ingredients exactly, though? Can you explain where they're found, like what they are in nature. So, um, yeah, so uh, Roliola rosea is actually found. You can find it in America, which is pretty cool. But it's ultimately just a. It's the golden flower. It's the golden root, and it. Um, and it grows in a lot of mountaintop kind of mountainous areas throughout America and into Asia. And then um, cordyceps is normally thought to be more in the Asian area. And it's, uh, it's actually the reason we get the Shroom Tech Sport name is because it's an actual mushroom, which is, sounds mm-hmm. kind of crazy, but it, it's, it is what it is. So, so about that mushroom. <laughs> it's not the fun kind. It's not the kind you're going to lay down and look at the meteorites go through the sky and it's going to make you have all these fun, crazy thoughts. Now, I love that mushroom, but I love this one too. So there's some there's some thing I read about and, is, and I may be wrong, but didn't like the Chinese Olympic team use cordyceps and like it, they said that it helped them with their, their trials in track and field or something like that? So um, actually a lot of... Um Eastern teams have used it. The Chinese have gone on record and said they use it. Uh, the Russians have said that they Putin. use it. Yeah, the so, Kremlin. So um, everything out east seems to use it a lot. Uh, and actually, a lot of people that I know, I've trained with, um, jujitsu lifters, just all around fitness enthusiasts, have taken cordyceps as its own product and have really talked about the great benefits. Yeah. So has this been something that is just kind of new? to the United States of America, because you mentioned like maybe China and Russia, they were maybe like the first to adopt it is, I imagine, and then we're just maybe a little bit late to the party? Um, I'd like to think not. Um, yeah, because America number one, right? Yeah, always, yeah, USA, <laughs> right? America first. Yeah. Um, it just seems that you would think that they'd be first because, I mean, the whole title is traditional Chinese medicine is yeah. normally how we think about it. So, What's traditional American medicine? Uh, <laughs> pharmaceutical uh, Vicks vapor rub uh, Vicks vapor yeah, rub Advil Vicks, yeah. Tylenol um, <laughs> Benadryl maybe Benadryl <laughs> <laughs> anything in pill capsule yeah really um, so yeah you would think that they'd be first but really the the supplement market is has mostly been based in like vitamins and now we're uh, just in the past I don't know I'd say 20 20 years maybe a little bit more the whole sports performance side of supplementations really come out. And so that's when we're starting to hear about all these crazy ingredients. And so people, and now the market's booming, mm-hmm. it's, you know, billion, literally with a B billions of dollars. And, um, and so now things are getting marketed and, you know, put on the front page and the Chinese use this and they have amazing weightlifters and the Russians have this and they have amazing athletes all the way through. And so, yeah, so it seems like we might be late, but I would like to think that 
it was more of an underground thing. Like pe- people were using it and taking it. It just wasn't like sitting right there on the shelf at, you know, your average Walmart or Target or mm-hmm. something along that line. Has anybody ever been flagged for these substances in competition? Do they test for these? Are these banned anywhere as far as you know? Um, as far as I know, these are not on the any of the banned substance lists. Um, so they're okay for college athletes to take? Yeah. As 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 it sits right now, and according to the last time I checked the um, the list, and it, there are a lot of lists lists to check. So make sure that if you do take a supplement in general, that you go through and talk to your governing body before you get into it. But um, but yeah, for the most part, these substances are very safe and very natural. Probably shouldn't uh, even call them substances. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Yeah, that's yeah. a little like a yeah. red line where these uh, uh, ingredients, herbs, yeah. mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I want to talk about some of the things that Shroom Tech Sport helps because I love playing soccer and I love doing anything like cardio related, anything that's like really high intensity. That's my favorite stuff to do. And like, I cannot play a game without Shroom Tech Sport. And it sounds like, oh, like a, like a rigged endorsement, but I'm serious. <laughs> like, I can notice the difference when I play a soccer game with Shroom Tech Sport and when I don't. And it's not, it's not like a feeling. It's not like one of those, you have your guys ever taking like pre-workouts that have like a lot of caffeine in them. Mm-hmm. I love those too, but you don't want to take those for soccer because like one, number one, I don't want to feel like your heart's going so fast doing cardio stuff. Like I don't want to feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. You know, I don't want, I don't want that feeling and I don't want to feel all, all shaky and, and fragile when I'm trying to concentrate, right. but I don't know why stream tech sport is like just money for me when it comes when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I want to talk a little about about workout stamina and stream tech sport because that's where I feel it's like the best. And that's all the NFL dudes that come he, come through here. That's that's what they say. That's like Joe DeFranco too. Uh, that awesome trainer Joe DeFranco who trains all those WWE and NFL dudes. He says the same thing. Like for workout stamina, it's awesome. And he's like ditching those pre workouts that have all those stimulants in them for stream tech sport. So, yeah, so we'll just start with you as, as a soccer player. Um, the ingredients, again, apart and together. First, what's really cool is actually um, Roliola has been shown to actually lower heart rate a little bit. So in oh, turn, okay. so people who say they get jacked up, it might be a little bit in their brain, like they take the pills and now they're ready, like they're ready to mm-hmm. go kind of thing. That might be a little placebo on their side because actually a lot of the studies have shown that it actually dips your heart rate a little bit, which might sound kind of crazy, but on the back end that you have a lower plateau to come off of. So now what you would think would be really hard feels a little easier because your heart's not beating out of your chest. Mm -hmm. So that may be one of the... um, and does that preserve your energy too? Because you're not working as hard, basically. I don't. I don't want to go as far as to say that it preserves your energy, but it definitely, like mentally, it's not going to make you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm working so hard. Like this is the hardest workout I've ever done. I yeah, because when quit. you use caffeine, like you feel like awesome at for a little while, right. and yeah. then it's like, Whoop. yeah, and then you, you, know, you have this just it's like an adrenaline dump. Stop, yeah. <laughs> and then I just don't want to do anything. Anymore. So, so yeah, it's got this nice. Um, Nice little dip to your heart rate for some studies, of course, not all of research completely agrees with this, but some studies have shown this dip and then you have this nice rise, which comes through Roliola, which really helps with the, um, the endurance part of it, the stamina part of it. So what that means to the average person first, you're not amped up. A lot of, um, a lot of pre-workouts are also going to have that beta alanine, which are going to make you tingle a lot. This isn't a tingling supplement, which is a good thing if you definitely don't like that tingling thing. Mm-hmm. Now, if you need that tingle, you might want to, I might suggest a beta alanine supplement on top of it. But actually with, uh, but as itself, you're not going to feel that, oh my gosh, I'm ready to go. Like we have to go right now. Why do you think people are so addicted to that? Why do you think, I mean, cause this goes for like regular foods too, like a healthy diet and stuff. Like why do people think that you have to feel something to, for there to be actual results? Like what is up with that? Maybe it's a uh, probably like a reinforcement of what you just took actually helped you do something because you're like, oh, now I feel mm-hmm. whatever. But like, yeah, after, if you feel something, you know it's having some effect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But after I eat, I feel better anyway, and I don't feel yeah. like raised up or tingly or anything like that. Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I mean, the reason we got Vince here today is to talk about this study that he was a part of uh, at Florida State University. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is a couple of years ago you were researching Shroom Tech Sport? Yeah, two and, years ago. Yeah. And you did a double blind study. So just give us a little background on that. So um, so ultimately, the uh, it's been, yeah, about two years of my life. And uh, it was, we took... We, we, this was before I actually worked it on it. So that's a, that's a nice little caveat for everyone <laughs> to know. But, um, so we take, we basically went right at the, uh, the idea of what's on the back of the label. Um, uh, most younger males are going to want a pre-workout that's going to help them through their workout and hopefully get, you know, leaner, stronger, faster, what, whatever their goals are. And we put them through a concurrent training model. So concurrent training is basically the combination of aerobic training and resistance training with the idea that hopefully you can achieve both aerobic goals and strength muscle mass goals at the same time. Um, what was that training like real quick? What did those workouts look like? So those workouts, it was, um, we did total four total workouts across the entirety of the, um, of a week. And the first one was a resistance training workout where we really looked at their squat and did a lot of accessory movements with their squat on the back end. So they had um, leg extensions would be a great example as a squat accessory movement. And then we had what we called our slow day, which may not sound slow after I'm done with it. But what we did was we had 10 rounds of two minutes of running, of high intensity interval training, of running, and then one minute of complete rest. And they ran at 85% of their VO2 max which is pretty high, right? So then we had a rest day and then we had a bench upper body day for the most part. Um, we threw in RDLs to get everybody really loose and t um, ready to go, but then focused on the upper body. We had an incline bench in there. We had pull downs, rows, so on and so forth. And then after that day, 24 hours later, we, um, we had what we called our fast day. And that was a brutal, brutal day. We, um, so well, they still had the same intervals, so 10 rounds of two minutes and one minute of rest, complete rest. And then they started at 90% of their VO2 max. And then we progressed this every week until they got to 120% of their VO2 max. And they were running at really, really fast speeds. We had some um, guys who were so fit that their 120% was actually faster than the treadmills could go at, <laughs> at the gym we were wow. training at. So we actually had to take them into the lab and like schedule them in to lab time so we could get this big. We had a monstrous, I think it was a Woodway, and it could go um, 25 miles an hour at a 30% incline. So it could really get them moving and they, they got it moving. So, um, so ultimately, so that was a fast day and then we just repeated all the way through. And we didn't just throw it together. It was, um, it was based on a lot of studies that already shown that those type of models, high intensity, separated by 24 hours to resistance training actually helps improve VO2 and um, maximal strength capacities. And when, where did Shroom Tech come into play? So Shroom Tech, um, like I said, we just, we just wanted to go at the, um, at the bottle. So we took the guys and we divided them based on their body composition, their VO2 max, their um, total strength, which was, we tested bench and squat and we put it together and then we put them in separate groups so basically the idea is that we have very similar people taking either a placebo or the shroom tech sport so each group was basically even there was no like ringers like one yeah. group is really athletic yeah we didn't side. like <laughs> stack like we didn't stack the steroid kids in one side <laughs> yeah. and you know the non the non lifters in the other in fact we controlled to make sure that no one was taking steroids and we actually tested Shroom Tech Sports make sure there weren't any steroids in that as well, because some people can stack their stuff a lot yeah. better for mm -hmm. um, for a study. But ultimately, um, as Sean said, it's a double blind, so I didn't know what they were taking. They didn't know what they were taking. Um, it was highly controlled. We wanted to make sure that they didn't change their diets. We wanted to make sure that there weren't any differences between the diets and the two groups. We wanted to make sure that they were doing all the reps and all the sets correctly, that they were doing the correct weight. Um, we wanted to make sure that they took their pills at the right time. The bottle says 45 minutes beforehand. We made sure that they took it 45 minutes beforehand. Um, we we basically parented these mm -hmm. collegiate males as much as collegiate males will let you parent them. 
Um, we even we even made sure that um, we controlled for caffeine intake and made sure that there wasn't a difference between the two. No groups. stone unturned. No stone unturned. <laughs> not not at Florida State, I'll tell you that. So um, so yeah, really highly controlled, um, really good program based in the literature, and then just through Shroom Tech Sporting and just tested because that's what they said they could do. So we're going to test it to see if that's what it does. Yeah. So after after you guys did the clinical trial, you had these athletes and you had these 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 positive results. Did some of these guys be like, hey, so like, did, I mean, did you guys tell them afterwards, like what they were, what they're given, like once it was all said and done? So yeah, so after the, after the game, like there's, um, it's basically like, look, trust us on the front end and we'll tell you on the back end. So at the end, um, we, we even ran hormone profiles, which is normally very expensive for anyone who's looked into their performance hormone profiles or whatever. Um, or checked your insurance bill whenever you go to the hospital when you're sick. And the, um, and so we gave them a package. It was like, look, you had the stuff, you didn't. And some people were disappointed. A lot of people were really happy with the way they saw their bodies change and their strength performance in general. So they, um, so obviously it was like, oh man, I really wanted the stuff. You know, I mean, everyone wanted the stuff, but like it's, when you see results on the back end anyway, it's not like, oh, well, I just wasted 12 weeks of my life. You know, I didn't get anything. Well, if Shroom Tech Sport like blew everybody out of the water and everyone else was like, wait, why, why, why didn't I get that? And so in that scenario, we probably would have been like, all right, here, here the, here's the Shroom Tech, go, go do the, go do the workouts again. Yeah. So, you know, there's nothing that says that we have to do these clinical trials. There's, there's nothing that says that we have to do these trials to prove our product. And so a lot of the supplement industry chooses not to do that. So, I mean, what's the reason behind that? You know, is it because they're, they're scared that maybe the, res the results may not become positive? Is that the main reason why most supplement companies don't do these clinical trials? Because they could come back false and then you're just kind of screwed. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, obviously I can't speak for uh, supplement companies, but a lot of... If you look at, there's a lot of literature supporting, and if you look at a lot of what supplement companies hang their hats on, it's, it's not the traditional medicine stuff. It's more the, the creatines, the beta alanines, and on it has products with those in them too, but um, when we test a product, we test the product here at um, on it, but a lot of the, the support is like, well, it already, like, it already works like individually so oh, so they just so you test. assume that okay so i've yeah. seen that i've seen that before where it's like this specific ingredient right has clinical trials and they link to all of these things but they didn't do the study on the entire product as a whole right so okay. and, and some do we at florida state we've done some some studies but studies cost money mm -hmm. and um especially if you go to um a level one research institution which is what florida state is um, you'll see like it's it's driven on a publish or perish um, environment. So professors are always trying to perish. If you went to one of these bigger schools, a lot of those professors are only teaching one, two classes, maybe three, maybe three um, across the entire semester. Um, so they want money. They're putting their time into um, into the actual research themselves so they can get um get their name recognition out there and on top of that the college recognition as well so that's kind of where the give comes and then it's not going to be and when they do the research they're not going to just want to do like all right take this pill and did they get stronger unfortunately um there's different levels of research that are kind of completed at these kind of universities and there's the master's level where it's okay how like did you get stronger? But if you want like the high power, you want a PhD student behind it, you want the um, the actual professor behind it, you're going to need to do like blood panels mm -hmm. and you're going to have to do um, hormone concentrations and so on and so forth, which means that one of those little plates costs roughly somewhere between $300 and $500 for something that's the size of a tape deck for those of us who remember what tape decks look like. <laughs> oh, I remember. And, um, Some of us do. Yeah. And, <laughs> They're um, coming back. And the, oh, are they nice? They are. <laughs> they are not coming back. Um, the size of a tape deck, and then you throw it away. It's not like you can like come back and reuse it every now and then. It's it's gone forever. So if you screw that up, then you gotta go get another one. And 
Florida State or whoever the research team is isn't going to pay for that. You're going to give them the money to pay for that. So that's that's another thing. A lot of these companies are based on like, well, this this isn't um like we can't like we can't afford this. This mm-hmm. is like a can't afford to take the risk that the product isn't going to work. <laughs> yeah, can, well, yeah, if the product doesn't work, you're sunk. And then yeah. if like, and you're definitely sunk because you sunk at least eighty grand into yeah. a product into a product study. Yeah, which then comes out and then says, oh, your stuff doesn't. You're work. almost placing a bet. <laughs> yeah, you're placing a really big like a really big bet. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that that might be one of the reasons why the other is like, look, we have we're sticking to the basics: the creatines, beta alanines, caffeine. We know that these things work across the line. We know these things sell. There's no real reason to actually test this product. So, drum roll, our study, what were the results? Um, they were actually real exciting. Um, Shrimp Tech Sport, um, now, this, this may be, sound like a weird caveat, but didn't work across the board, which is okay, because across fitness, there's a lot, there's a lot of realms of fitness. You have the parkour people, you have the bodybuilders, you have the endurance, the ultra endurance runners that have to go, you know, like run for days on end. You have um, CrossFitters and and the list goes on and everyone knows that and everyone has their thing for the most part. Um, the, yeah, not everybody's built out of the same mold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> and um, so what we found is across the entirety of the study that we put together, there was no differences in strength, aerobic performance and so on and so forth, which is okay. But as we started to look into the actual training data itself, we found that as we put together into sections. So uh, a a great example would be the resistance training. So if we looked at the lower intensity for higher repetitions areas and then worked it all the way down and we we tapered that all the way down to twos at 92.5%, I believe. Sets of two, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sets of two. Sorry. Um, And so... And we clumped all those together, maximal, high intensity, moderate intensity, and light intensity. And we found that in that moderate intensity range that Shroom Tech Sport actually outperformed the placebo by four reps, I believe. What rep range was this? Um, That's in the 72 to 77% area, which is where a lot of gym goers are going to go, especially for the resistance training one. It's like sets of 10 to 12. Yeah, sets of 10 to 12, um, your standard person. And... And that's for the guy that wants to squeeze out a couple extra reps on the back end. We were tracking the inv- the volume of the entirety, and every exercise they did, they the last set they did to failure. So we tracked how many reps can you do. We if we said you're doing ten and you felt like you were doing twelve, you pushed twelve and then went for thirteen nine times out of ten. So we really pushed the guys. We really beat them up. It was a brutal study. It was brutal and. um so, but in squeezing out those extra reps, that's what we found. So if we take that idea of just resistance training first, um, we can, where does that apply? So for our barbell sports that where repetition matters, um, CrossFit is a great example. A lot, the, fir- the deeper you get into the games, which are going on right now, I think, right? I'm pretty sure they are. Mm-hmm. Um, as you go deeper into the games, the margin for win is smaller and smaller and smaller. On the same idea, the margin for win in the Olympics is smaller and smaller and smaller because the group is getting more and more and more elite, right? So you have that nice win right there. And then you also, if we look at our high-intensity interval training, as, as the weeks got faster, as we talked about, it's harder and harder to stay on the treadmill. We can't make them stay on the treadmill for two minutes at 120%. They get shot off the back and that's not good for the, the participant or for the study because now you have a participant. The wall behind yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, because now you have a participant in the wall who's probably not going to continue on with the run, much less the entire study. Um, and so as we carried out, so volume goes down. Makes sense. Run gets harder, volume's going to go down. But at 100% of VO2 max, like repeated all-out sprinting, um, we saw that Shroom Tech Sport actually had a smaller decrease, if that makes sense. So two negatives, a smaller decrease than they lost the less. Yeah, yeah, they lost less, which means that ultimately, if you flip that the other way around, they spent more time on the treadmill. They had a longer running time, which is great. I think they lost like 41 seconds in, over the entirety of those 10 of those 10 running sessions or sets, if you will, and then. 
the placebo group actually lost 135 seconds across the entirety of those 10 sets as well. So that's obviously a huge difference, right? Minus 41 is obviously a lot smaller than minus 135, which is sweet. So, so what's that mean? So going, coming back to soccer, so that could be a couple more laps up and down the field. If you're a hockey player on the ice, so on and so forth. If you're a, um, just an avid gym goer and you just enjoy like hitting, hitting the bikes or something like that, spin class or something like that, you, get, you can get an extra sprint and you can get a few more extra sprints, which in turn, right, you would think that the more volume you can achieve either in resistance training or in aerobic training, would mean that in theory, you could get a little deeper into your adaptation that you're looking for. As long as you stay within those intensity ranges, you're gonna be, you're gonna be able to push it a little further than those who are not taking shrimp to export is, is what we can um, get out of that data. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also cool to note that th these guys were, uh, they weren't exactly athletes like at the school, but they were very recreationally well-trained. These guys were experienced exercisers, right? They had, they were not like neophytes in the gym who, for whom anything would have worked. Yeah, no, absolutely. They, um, they were very fit, especially cardiovascular wise. We, um, like I said, we had guys that were, um, even before we got to that 120% on the, on the treadmill, they had to come into the actual lab so we could use lab grade equipment to train them at those high intensities. Um, they had a VO2 max of roughly 55 to start. Um, for those who don't know what that means, um, is a relative VO2 max in milliliters per kilogram per minute. And it basically means that they are in not quite, I wouldn't call them elite, but they're definitely in a superior class. Um, 40 is roughly like where you consider a fit person to be 55 is obviously much higher than that. Um, so yeah, very fit group of individuals. They had an average training, average training years of roughly, um, I think it was seven, six to seven years, somewhere in there as well. And so we didn't, we didn't pick the new kids on the block. We didn't pick sedentary individuals. We picked people who had a, a fitness mentality, a, a bunch of go-getters too. You would. You'd see him shaking underneath the, the squat rack every now and then. It's like, oh, I don't know if he should do this, but he's about to try it. So here we go. Oh. That, that's worth noting because so many of these studies are done on untrained individuals where if they just switched, I had a friend of mine, trainer, say one time, if they just switched from drinking regular beer, beer to light beer, they would have lost weight and seen an improvement. So like, <laughs> that's, that's a study I can get behind. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah, a lot of people can get behind it. Uh, there's also something else we should point out too. Uh, there was something about the... Uh, uh, I don't know. Tell me something else about the study. Uh, <laughs> Sean, where's your alpha brain today? Uh, yeah, yeah, where's your alpha brain, man? Um, so That is a study too, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's another talk. Um, what else? So, like I oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's what it was. I, what I want to bring up was, was the training program itself was effective, which you designed, I believe. So take a little credit for that. Take a bow. Uh, the, the workouts were so effective. That's another reason these guys didn't see massive changes across the board because the, the, the training, the, you know, the actual workout intensity was so good by itself. That was eliciting results too. So as I said, um, I, I'm, I, I'm a strength coach as well. I've been a strength coach before. I've worked with a lot of um, athletes bodybuilder, so on and so forth. But the, the, like I said, all of the, most of the methodology came exactly from the literature. So it's not like we just pulled it out of air and hope that everything worked. Um, what's really cool is that just recently, like 2014, the whole idea of concurrent training has started to switch. So it used to be that, um, especially for my weightlifters, my Olympic weightlifters and my, my power lifters, cardio is going to kill your gains, bro. Don't you do it. You're going to lose your mass. You're going to lose your- I hate your... that. <laughs> I hate that so much. Like, why do you have to choose one of these? Yeah, exactly. So so it's, so it's that's always been kind of the dogma. And it's it's been starting to change over. And in the literature, actually, 2014, I, I believe is the earliest that I've seen it, was that it started to switch. So now we have this idea that, okay, high intensity interval training. So we're not training ourselves with this really moderate intensity that 50 to 70 ish percent of your vo2 max or of your heart rate max however you want to gauge it they're, they're they're very nicely related but the um so now we ramp it up and we go faster now we have the idea of now we're making our legs work at a powerful high intensity and so we have to move and we can't sustain that as long as everyone knows you can't sprint forever right that's pretty yeah. simple 
Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you seen me, man? Yeah, yeah I've seen, seen you. Let's go. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll 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 time you after after the uh, after the cast. But um, so so that's the first idea, and then the second idea, uh, more recently in 2016, I believe, actually showed that it's not just the intensity that matters, but how far it's separated from the actual muscle that's being used in your resistance training itself. So to take a step back, real quick, if you train aerobically in your legs that's where you're going to lose a lot of your strength at so a lot of studies have shown that even though if you train aerobically in your legs and you do a total body workout your upper body still gets pretty strong it's nice because you're not subjecting the same muscles to damn it two i different needed a workouts. fucking excuse and that <laughs> just took my excuse away i know <laughs> exactly damn you, it was science yeah <laughs> um but that's that could be some of the reasons why you see a lot of those guys that are like really top heavy, but not so much in the in the <laughs> lower half. You know what I'm talking about? So, um, so now in this second study in 2016 that showed that if you separate it for from from the resistance training by 24 hours, I'm pretty sure that study was done in. Russia. 